it's time. As an aspired video essayist, or in other words, a yapper, it's my rightful duty to make at least one video about Fallout New Vegas. With my 200 hours of playtime, I love the game, but I feel like examining the individual parts of New Vegas takes away the magic of it. I can sit here and repeat all the points you've heard about the music, gameplay, or story, but New Vegas is more than that. So here's my clumsy attempt at explaining why New Vegas is a game full of paradoxes, Damn, running low on and why those things make it good. But as always, the game was rigged from the start. Welcome to Good Springs. In many discussions about role-playing games, the topic of choices and consequences gets brought up often. This refers to a core concept of the genre. The player can make a choice and it will have at least a consequence. Holy moly. If you hadn't come here like you done, I'd be a goner for sure. Basically a cost-effect relationship. It's up to the game to decide how the decisions are presented and how far would the consequences reach the player. Fallout New Vegas opens with a heated conflict. Looks like our little town got itself dragged into the middle of something we don't want anything to do with. After getting two 9mm projectiles plucked out from our cranium by Doc Mitchell, we are thrust right into a brewing firefight between the people of Goodspring and the Powder Gangers. I'm going to get my friends and we're burning this town to the ground. Got it? Good Spring is a small town with about a dozen people, all of which pretty much keep to themselves, save for her. Don't worry, she won't bite unless I tell her to. I like sunny smiles. The Powder Gangers, on the other hand, are the polar opposite. Chain gangs, really. The NCR brought the men from California to work on the rail line. They're convicts of the New California Republic. The Powder Gangers overpowered the wardens at the correction facility, a fancy word for jail, and made it their base. It turns out that giving convicts a bunch of dynamite and blasting powder isn't the best idea. Due to the gross competence of the NCR, this gang started to terrorize the roads and towns around them with impunity. This includes, but not limited to, ambushing merchant caravans. After a nuclear fallout, moving goods with mutated cows is most suited for the Mojave heat. On that day, the Powder Gangers attack a caravan from the Crimson Caravan Company on the way near Goodspring. Almost all of the caravan members died, save for this guy. Sorry about the gun. You just caught me off guard, that's all. Ringo escaped to town, and being the kind folk that the Good Spring residents are, they took him in. About a week ago, this trader, Ringo, comes into town. Survivor of an attack, he says. We figured he was just in shock, so we gave him a place to lie low. However, the Powder Gang has won his head since he killed a few of their members. He's some trader who decided he'd rather shoot than pay the toll for being in our territory. He's hiding somewhere in town. This is Joe Cobb, the de facto spokesperson for the Powder Gang is here. This is where we're presented with a choice. We can be a good Samaritan and join hands with the Good Spring residents to fend off the bandits. If we succeed, we'd get 100 caps from Ringo and good reputation with the town and the Crimson Caravan. I owe you a huge favor for this. Money. But this also locks out the Powder Ganger's questline because we killed their members and are vilified to them. The less morally acceptable choice is to side with the Powder Gangers and take over Goodspring. Shit yeah, Mayor Cobb. I like the sound of that. Doing this will ruin our reputation and karma. But in turn we'll get a nice faction questline. If you want to make some caps, head on over to the correctional facility. The last choice is to walk away from the conflict. This isn't our fight, not the place for us to step in. The conflict will work itself out. This choice doesn't give us any punishment, but also no reward. Now many analysis will stop here and draw a conclusion that New Vegas offers the player many choices and it encourages player freedom. That's not wrong, but it's not enough. I believe the magic doesn't lie in the fact that we get to choose, but how our choices affect us. Let's take a look at another video game opening. Hey, you. Finally awake. Skyrim also starts with a conflict. In fact, it goes even further than New Vegas. In Goodspring, we're a bystander, but here in Skyrim, the Empire is marching us to the chopping block without even stating our crime. He's not on the list. Forget the list. He goes to the block. Why are you satyrs? By your orders, Captain. This is a silly and danger. The only thing we did wrong is to cross the border at the same time the Empire caught Ulfric Stormcloak. You're the leader of the rebellion. Oh God. Where are they taking us? And the dragon shows up, we make the run for hell and keep, you know the drill. Sentries, what do you see? Ah! 
Here comes the choice. Fine. I hope that dragon takes you all to Sovereign Guard. You, come on. We can go with Hardvar and fight along the Imperial soldiers. Or with Ralov and side with the Stormcloak. And none of this matter. We could slaughter 20 soldiers of a faction here and they will welcome us with open arms later. Hell, we can even meet with a relative of either Ralov or Hadvar in Riverwood and they wouldn't care if we just killed their brothers or son. Same choice between two factions as New Vegas, except we don't suffer any consequences. And herein lies our first paradox. The consequences that restrict the players actually enhance their freedom. Sounds weird, but hear me out. Imagine in the Good Spring Conflict, we side with the town and killed a bunch of powder gangers. Then two hours later, we waltz right into their base with no repercussion and do the faction questline. This means that our choice of siding against the gang at the beginning is meaningless. We might as well walk away from it and it would make no difference. If the consequences restrict the players from certain part of the game, they stand to gain and lose certain experience. Now the choices have meaning because the consequences validate them. And, you know, it's true that the Civil War subplot of Skyrim does lock you out from either the Empire or the Stormcloak at certain points. But here's the kicker. Those consequences are cosmetic. No matter which side we choose, the experience is practically the same. We have the same quest objective, same quest locations, and the resolution of the Civil War has so little effect on the main quest line or the world it's barely noticeable. We don't stand to lose any experience because it's all the same. When both choices lead to the same conclusion, there's really no choice. And in the absence of choice, there's no freedom. And at Bethesda, the games we were making were so big, we had to take the approach of, well, everybody's got to be able to do this at some point. We can't lock off content that way. But when you play Baldur's Gate 3, you get the impression, rightly so, that this decision I'm about to make will close off parts of the game and open up others. Yeah. And it's, it, it's meaningful. That, that means something. This is one of the reasons why New Vegas is still relevant 13 years later despite having only a serviceable gameplay and mediocre graphic. Each time we play, the adventure slightly changes based on our choices. We find new details, new interactions that we have never seen before despite our hundreds of hours of gameplay. This is the mythical thing many call player freedom. What in the goddamn? Talking about choices and consequences, it's mandatory that we bring up the story of New Vegas. It's excellent, brilliantly written, but not in the way you think. The fundamental difference between an open world RPG like New Vegas and a classic novel lies here. Yes, you, my dear viewer, are the difference. In fact, you are one of the most important factor when it comes to the story, because you are the one setting the pace for yourself. With a novel, we read it cover to cover, up to down and left to right, except for some countries. The author sets the speed and we're the passengers strapped in to enjoy the ride. But a non-linear game doesn't work like that. While it's true that the story of a video game has literary characteristics, things like story arc, characters and settings for example, but the way that the story unfolds lies entirely in the player's hands. The story of New Vegas is about many things, one of which is to find a guy who shot us twice in the face. With the nuclear hellfire torched Nevada, Las Vegas was sheltered from the carnage by Mr. House. As the vault dwellers slowly made their way back to the surface, they formed tribes and groups to survive. So the elusive Mr. House invited three tribes in the Mojave Desert to the Strip and re-civilized them. One of these tribes is the chairman. The guy who shot us is Benny, one of the chairmen at the top casino in the New Vegas Strip. There are three routes to the New Vegas Strip from the town of Good Spring. The easiest but also longest one that's intended for new players is down south to Prim, Nipton and then up north again past Novak. Picking this route means that we get to see a lot of the Mojave Desert and its people. But if you're skilled enough to sneak past Quarry Junction from Good Spring, you can basically skip the entire first part of the story. Oh shit! Oh shit! Let's not talk about the third round with the Cazadors. That means with enough determination and luck, we can go kill Benny the moment we exit Good Spring. Do what you gotta do, baby. Over here! If Fallout New Vegas is a traditional novel, this is awful. We're doing the equivalent of reading the first 10 pages and flip the book to the last chapter, something only the utterly insane would do. So let's say, okay, we're gonna write the great American novel. It's gonna be this thing. And on every page will be written comedy and tragedy and it'll be wonderful, it'll be amazing. And you're gonna give this book, this great American novel to the player. And what are they gonna do with it? 
they're going to rip out every page and make paper airplanes out of them. Even if New Vegas is a non-linear video game, making paper planes out of the story still ruins the flow, right? This is the second paradox. By allowing the player to skip certain parts, the story of New Vegas maintains its cohesion. Do you remember what I said a bit ago? It's excellent, brilliantly written, but not in the way you think. Yeah, the story is written so that even the sequence breaking is taken into consideration. By skipping the majority of the southern locations, we can skip the Prim conflict, the Boulder City situation, and never come into contact with the Legion and the Brotherhood of Steel. A huge chunk of the story can be ignored if we so choose. We will still get a chance to interact with those factions, albeit in a different context. Crazier yet, we could sneak past Quarry Junction, head to the Vegas trip, deal with Benny, and then retake the route south and the NPCs will recognize this. Oh, I don't know if you recognize me from the strip when I handed you the mark of Kaisar. I wasn't wearing a dog's head at the time. The game has a reaction for every order of actions the player could take, so the story can be tackled however you like. Another game that allows this sort of sequence break is Morrowind, specifically the failsafe ending where we need to find Yagun Bagarn to activate the Wraith Guard, allowing that alternative path elevated the story to such a new height. This paradoxical design extends even further than the main story. A lot of quests can be finished out of order too, one of the best examples I can think of is Vault 22 and the quests related to it. The game has multiple ways to guide us to Vault 22, a vault experiment with plant growth that went wrong. There are 6 quests, 4 marked and 2 unmarked that involve this location. Each quest has a different objective, and we can pick up the quest items anytime we want. But this won't trigger the related quest, so we can pick up a quest item on total accident. Only when the quest begins do we realize that we have gotten the required item. And we even get a special dialogue for picking it up earlier than the intended time. The system says that the files were accessed recently and copied to an external source. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? If we have prior knowledge of where things are, we can choose to skip certain parts of the game, and it will reward us just as much if not more than doing the quest the intended way. There's no artificial barrier to gate off the player's progress. That's the brilliance of New Vegas writing, beside the charming dialogues and amazing characters. Oh come now, don't play the fool. Vegas has fools enough, a superfluity of them. Why do you play video games? I play them because I enjoy interacting with a fictional world. Many would play games for escapism, to get away from their reality. It's either to remind themselves of a better time, or just to forget about the current things. For whatever reason we play video games, fact is, we're pursuing an experience that can substitute our own reality with something better. Or worse, if you're a streamer and the new Rage game is out. Despite this, the closer the game comes to resemble reality, the more compelling it is. But first, we must understand the difference between feeling real and realistic. It's not about the photorealistic graphic, story or characters. It's about the internal logic of the game. Killing an enemy and they drop some loot. Finishing a quest and we get some experience. Taking the shorter route might be more dangerous. As long as the fictional world functions on some laws that we can detect and understand, the game feels real. New Vegas is nowhere near realistic. They're talking sentient robots and aliens in the game for crying out loud. Howdy, partner! Might I say you're looking fit as a fiddle? The story is quite absurd. The factions are written with glaring flaws and the characters are, well, lovely. Nobody's dick's that long. Not even Long Dick Johnson and he had a fucking long dick. And here is our last paradox. By not trying to simulate reality, but telling a good story, Fallout New Vegas comes as close to reality as possible. The key is internal consistency. Boone started as an angry, guilt-ridden veteran. My wife's dead. I want the son of a bitch who sold her. And came to accept reality of losing his wife. There was no choice in what I did. It was more like being forced to watch something you can't stop. And found his purpose in protecting people from the Legion. One less Legion raiding party running loose now. Still feels like I'm living on borrowed time. But I don't see any reason not to take a lot more of those sons of bitches with me. Veronica was a young Brotherhood of Steel member that grew disillusioned with the leadership and had to learn to let go. The companions are consistent throughout their character arcs. There's not a single moment where it feels like they're acting out of character for the plot. The NCR and the Legion both want to rebuild the world and avoid another total destruction. Both are flawed in their logics. The new California Republic models the system after old America, which has its merits but also vulnerable to corruption and incompetency. As they expand rapidly eastward, their resources are stretched thin, rendering them almost powerless. The layers of bureaucracy also doesn't help. But the Legion isn't better either. 
Many merchants praise Caesar for protecting trades, but when we land in their base across the Colorado River, we can see their living conditions. All the slaves are women, degenerates get crucified and legionaries get trained from a young age. This living condition is not for human. Even if the legion's conquest is successful and they united all of America, the transition from a machine of war to a republic is almost impossible. Both factions stay very consistent with their philosophies. Both want expansion and will not compromise on their methodology. Our presence there only amplify or hinder their progress. This consistency persists throughout the story too. Any events that we are a part of is acknowledged by the game through Mr. New Vegas, the radio announcer, or the reactions of other NPCs. If we follow the Yes Men route and resolve the conflicts with all, and I mean all of the factions in New Vegas, we can see the result of our choices in the ending slides after we finish the game. Every choice we make has a visible consequence on the narrative no matter how absurd it is. New Vegas is a very special game. It offers player choices that can restrict them, allows the players to break its story, and doesn't take itself too seriously. And yet it's hailed as one of the best RPGs of all time by many and is still relevant till today. Maybe the last paradox is that just like art, the more we try to analyze New Vegas, the more we lose track of why it's good. It's not just about the single thing. Hell, it's not all about the game. It's about you. You are the key piece to why New Vegas is good. You are the one who brings all those experiences to life. You are the one who created those memories for yourself. You are a part of the art piece. Thank you for making it this far. Hit thrust that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video. And bye!